Good evening, everyone. My name is Lucy. I work at the Mississauga Library, and I'm your facilitator for this event. If you're having any technical difficulties, please message me or my colleague Elizabeth in the chat. Welcome to our virtual program, Lecture Me. Tonight, our program is Learning Technology Systems in Everyday Life, Women's Experiences Navigating Refugee Resettlement with Professor Nikki Daya. We start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and Wyandot Nations. We recognize these peoples and their ancestors as peoples who inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to many global Indigenous peoples. As a municipality, the city of Mississauga is actively working towards reconciliation by confronting our past and our present, providing space for Indigenous peoples within their territory to recognize and uphold their treaty rights and to support Indigenous peoples. We formally recognize the Anishinaabe origins of our name and continue to make Mississauga a safe space for all Indigenous peoples. And now a really quick overview of WebEx. On your screen, you'll see a chat box on the right hand side where the blue arrow is. You can select to message the host or panelists. Share your questions and comments during the program using your, your this feature. If you put your questions in the chat box as you as they come up, they will they will be part of the Q and A at the end of the presentation. Also, to let you know, closed captioning is enabled for this program. You can turn captioning on or off by clicking on the CC button in the bottom left-hand corner, indicated by the yellow rectangle. Once the captioning is turned on, you're also able to adjust the font size or change the background color to light or dark by clicking on the three dots at the end of the black bar that appears. The box in the middle with the green arrows is for reactions. Please let us know how you feel about what is being shared. Feel free to interact. Many of the 24-7 digital services offered by Mississauga Library are available for free with your library card, and they're also available from your home at mississaugalibrary.ca. We offer a large collection of ebooks and audiobooks through Libby by Overdrive and Hoopla. Hoopla also offers music, movies, TV shows, and comics. You can access digital magazines through Flipster and RB Digital for magazines. Press Reader has newspapers from all over the world in more than 60 languages. Free downloadable and streamable music is also available from Freegal, and you can learn a huge number of languages on Mangle languages. LinkedIn Learning offers opportunities to learn all kinds of new skills, everything from 3D animation, finance, and even writing skills. Please visit the library website or call us for details. Library newsletters are a nice way to find out what's happening at the library and other interesting news. Sign up for weekly newsletters so you can learn more about our upcoming programs and services. Our next Lecture Me program will be on April 4th at 7 p.m. and presenter Professor Johnson will be doing How Children Learn Language. Now I'm going to pass it over to Rima Chakra from UTM to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Rima Abushakra. I'm from the Experiential Education Unit, Office of the Vice Principal, Academic and Dean at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. In collaboration with the Mississauga Library System, welcome to our lecture meet talk featuring Professor Negan uh, Daya from the Institute of, uh, for Communication, Culture, Information and Technology, also known as ICCIT. As a social scientist, Professor Daya conducts qualitative research informed by endographic and visual, visual methodologies. These primarily include interviews, observations, and visual documentation of participant-made media like um, digital videos or photographs. Her research contributes to the domain of critical media education, refugee education, and technology. She explores the role of relationships between education and technology within the constraint of low-income communities, media education programs, and refugee camps, and in relation to the systemic, systemic socio-technical factors that influence migration and resettlement in North America. Her work focuses on girls and women, as well as people of color, and the way their own engagement with media and technology serve and support them. 
In her work, Professor Daya identifies systemic, systemic structures of power, privilege, and oppression that influence those rea realities and are entangled in pedagogy, curriculum, media, and technology. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Daya. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much and thank you for the lovely introduction and to all of you for being here. Um, let me just get my screen shared with you. Make sure that that's in order. Great. And uh, you can see my slides. Yeah, thumbs up. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, well, let me uh, just get started and jump in. Hopefully, we'll have some time at the end for discussion. Um, my name is Nagin Daya. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto at the Mississauga campus, primarily in the Institute of Communication, Culture, Information, and Technology. Um, this particular presentation, this talk is called Learning Technology Systems in Everyday Life women's experiences navigating refugee resettlement. The study was conducted uh, a few years ago and then there was a little bit of a delay in, uh, in processing time with the pandemic. Um, I actually collected data for this study while I was still working in the United States. I used to work at the University of Washington at the information school there. So um, you'll see that much of this study is based uh, in the United States and in Seattle. Um, however, I, I will try to sort of draw some connections into the Canadian context at, at minimum in the uh, in the beginning and in the framing. So let's let's get started and let me talk a little bit about where we sort of situated the nature of this problem. So what we sort of understood um, as something that is really an ongoing problem is that access to technology, particularly digital technology, represents uh, a major and important step in a refugee resettlement process. So it is critical for um, new immigrants of uh, any sort of designation, regardless of sort of entry point, to really uh, become familiar with the digital and technological landscape of a new environment. Refugees in particular have often had a rather <clears throat> tumultuous kind of uh, entry into their, their new setting, excuse me. And so that sort of disruptive path <coughs> can often mean that there are additional um, steps to take in order to, to uh, gain the language skills and the digital literacy, literacy skills that are needed um, to uh, become uh, familiar with the, the landscape of technology in their new environment. Technology is integrated with and supports employment, language learning, navigation, it creates connectedness, communication, and mobility. And for women, technology access and education are critical to more active, uh, actively engage in the social, economic, and cultural life of their communities. And even within a Western context, um, there are uh, a number of ways in which women are marginalized from technology domains and industries. And this is true for, for everyone and then exacerbated again for uh, new migrants, for newcomers, for refugees, um, and women in migration are often at a higher risk of social marginalization um, and then further on the outskirts of technology. So this is sort of the landscape where we saw the problem and entered into our study. I'm going to start by talking about the, the context of refugee resettlement and particularly in the US um, and in Washington state where this study was conducted. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit at this moment about, you know, a little bit of the context of Canada as well, just so that you can see some of the comparisons and think about how that also applies here. So Refugee is a legal term defined as someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. <clears throat> In the United States, someone's legal status as a refugee 
um, or another type of migrant determines what type of government services they can receive. So refugee for many is uh, a, a short term uh, uh, sort of categorization. There are many individuals and in other research that I've done who don't identify with the term refugee at all. Um, it is not necessarily a designation that people uh, that some people want to hold on to for a long time. Others feel that it is important, an important part of their own development and are okay to hold on to it, but it's not something um, that we would assume somebody should be referred to as a part of their life history um, as something that is permanent, right? It is a legal status. It is something that you uh, experience for a time, for some a longer time than others. Um, what's important, though, is that the designation of refugee uh, and that legal status and pathway to entry to resettlement in the United States, as well as in Canada, open certain doors and, and sometimes can close others. So in particular, in the United States, during the first 90 days of resettlement, funding goes to refugee serving organizations to help refugees apply for financial assistance, enroll in programs, get oriented in their new home and prepare for employment. This reality shapes much of the programming and cultural learning available to and imparted on newly arrived refugees. So that first 90 days, there's a lot of money that goes into these organizations in order to do very specific things, in order to try to help refugees sort of get, um, get oriented with housing, employment, uh, and language learning. Refugees resettle in the United States through a formal process, um, but their needs and experiences vary widely, of course, based on each person's lived experiences, their family structure, their previous uh, education and economic status. Um, and this process is structured, um, you know, in a way that is sort of the same for everybody. Right, so you can imagine the, the challenges that sort of come with that, depending on who you are. Now, in 2021, the resettlement ceiling in the United States was the lowest in the 40 year history of the refugee resettlement program. So here are uh, some figures on how refugee admissions have varied um, through different administrations, Obama, Trump, and then moving into the, the current Biden administration. Um, the Trump administration had set the refugee camp for a cap for 2021 to 15,000, the lowest it had been in the 40 year history of the US refugee resettlement program. Um, the Biden White House at first announced that it was going to keep the cap at this level, um, but then since has backtracked due in part to significant backlash. President Biden has now affirmed that the United States has a commitment to welcoming refugees by increasing the total admission ceiling in um, 2022 and 2023. Um, to 125,000, which is the highest target in several decades. Now, refugee in refugee admissions in Canada, as a comparison, now in 2020 were 9,000. I mean, 2020, of course, was a, a, an anomalous year. Um, 2021 increased to 20,000, and in 2022, I couldn't find the final figures, just the note on the targeted figures of 55 to 79,000. I'll show some other stats that suggest that we did perhaps reach these, these goals. Um, you know, keeping in mind that there are 10 times as many people in the United States and the geographic size and the, the economies, we can sort of put some ideas together about where priorities lie for these different different governments. Now, uh, Washington state in particular uh, ranks in the top 10 US states for refugee resettlement. Um, the lives of women who experience forced migration and enter the United States as refugees are often overlooked as a distinct category within these groupings. Um, we often hear refugees talked about as a homogenous group, and that is, uh, you know, very much inaccurate. And we rarely hear about further differentiations by, um, you know, sex and gender based categories, sexuality, ability, race, language, and all of the other distinguishing sort of characteristics that make our experiences in the world different. In Washington, um, about two thirds of refugees come from five countries, Iraq, uh, Myanmar, Somalia, Bhutan, and Ukraine. 
um, country of origin, along with age, sex, gender, sexuality, religion, class, education, and migration paths all impact individual experiences of forced migration. Um, and these, of course, impact how families experience their resettlement. Uh, worldwide, there are close to 70 million people who are displaced. 26 million of these do live as refugees. 40 million live in internally displaced conditions. Um, and so you can imagine and see that, uh, you know, the figures that we are looking at, you know, here are minuscule. The vast majority of refugees um, do end up in neighboring developing countries and they end up in these protracted or long-term refugee uh, situations for uh, on average 17 years. In the United States that those few who are resettled, um, they have that 90 day period of reception and placement. So they have some services including financial aid available to them. By the time they enter the transitional period two, which is from 90 days to one year, so three months, not a long time, they are expected to have a certain amount of economic self-sufficiency, which is extremely difficult as you can imagine. Um, there are some long-term supports and community engagements and whatnot and uh, community-based organizations that continue to offer services, but the longer out you go, of course, the less is available through the, through the government. Now, in Canada, things are a little bit different. Um, so claims by country of persecution in 2021 here in Canada, you have sort of a list here with some different figures. Um, a large number of claims coming with people from Mexico, India, Iran, Colombia, Turkey, a um, number of other countries that I've listed here. I sort of just grabbed the ones that were over about 500 claims per year. So an asylum claim would be somebody who is looking um, for a refugee status, right, to enter the country or to stay in the country based on their asylum claim. Um, so these are not necessarily those who have been granted admission, but those who are requesting that they be either allowed to enter or to stay um, based on their, their uh, persecution. Um, by province, this is from 2022, we can see that at all ports of entry, this is from the Government of Canada website, um, and suggest that Quebec gets actually the vast majority of the asylum claims um, at ports of entry, uh, in addition to Ontario and across the rest of the country. It's very, very thin. So I think that's just some interesting sort of framing for thinking about our location in Ontario, bordering, of course, Quebec. Um, and being, of course, uh, you know, all of the all of the, the provinces, you know, for the most part, do have um, proximity to the U.S. border um, by land. Um, but you know, the density, I suppose, of of Ontario and Quebec is part of the draw, and perhaps just our regional geographic location also makes a difference. In Canada, the um, resettlement supports are slightly different. So particularly if you come through the government program, there is private sponsorship of refugees as well, um, where refugees uh, in either case need to, uh, are, are given one year of support. So if you go through the government program, that year of support comes from the government or up to one year. Uh, if you become self-sufficient before that, then you would no longer receive the assistance um, from the government. If you are coming through a private sponsorship program, then the private sponsors are expected to uh, fundraise that equivalent for you. So uh, refugees have access to the resettlement assistance program income for up to one year. And then there are various kinds, kinds of housing support needs assessment and access to a range of government funded settlement programs, which is of course like language learning and digital literacy. So with all of that sort of in place, let me talk about our specific study and what we found. We looked to refugee women 18 years and older who were in the Seattle metropolitan area. And the questions that we asked were how do refugee women interact with and learn how to use technology in their daily lives? 
what technological access and education programs and services are available to them. And our goals have been to inform programs and policy design based on women's uh, experiences and needs. We approach this study from the standpoint of a feminist socio-technical theory. So this is essentially a theory that really looks at the relationship between society and technology, the ways in which society and technology are sort of mutually shaping forces from a feminist perspective, looking at the experiences of women, looking at how uh, technologies impact and interact with women in particular, and of course, in this case, with refugee women in particular. We also adopted a broad definition of technology in this case. So what I mean by that is that today, oftentimes when we talk about technology, we think about and we focus on information and communication technologies, computers, mobile phones, um, algorithms, internet, networks, connectivity, and so forth. Um, in effect, of course, there are many other types of technology around us all the time. Cars, sewing machines, you know, media and technology, laundry, dish, dishwashers, technologies, you know, some of which are, are older, but that have, have been and continue to be life-changing for women in particular in a lot of ways. So we ins ensured that we asked about these technologies as well, um, sort of pushing back on the idea that the only technologies that matter today are digital, uh, digital technologies. So uh, a focus on technology is important because as I mentioned, uh, technology has historically disadvantaged women and constructed exclusionary environments that deter and limit women's learning, engagement, and development. We take the stance in this way that technology is not neutral, um, that there are distinct ways that gender and technology intersect in the daily lives of women, and that gender-based expectations and social norms influence who uses technology, how, when, and for what purpose. Oops. Um, we had to think, of course, carefully about what it meant to work with vulnerable populations, about representing multiple voices and varied voices, how to respect cultural norms and social norms in this engagement, um, and the relevance of the work to the field. We didn't want to conduct this research if it wasn't going to matter and be able to be used. So we started with a uh, desk research and preliminary discussions with key informants from refugee serving organizations. Um, we, uh, of course, did a sort of literature review. We looked at what kinds of programs were around. We reached out to people in uh, refugee serving organizations and talked to them about what we were doing and about the relevance of our study and how it might be useful for them or what more we needed to think about in order to make it useful. We then conducted 26 interviews, uh, formal research interviews with service providers, so people working directly with refugee women on technology-related programs across the Seattle area. And we also recruited uh, refugee women to participate in focus group discussions. Um, and we uh, conducted uh, six or seven focus groups with, uh, maybe it was five or six fo focus groups with 23 women. There was one that ended up being like a group of two, and there was one that ended up being an interview um, because, you know, only one person showed up and so forth. Recruitment of refugee women happened through the same service organizations, um, and women were often offered a stipend for their participation. Um, and the women came from a range of communities, Russian, Ukrainian, Vietnamese, Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq, Somalia, Kuwait, Ethiopia, and one who self-identified as Burmese. Most of the focus groups involved members of the same ethno-linguistic community, so within each focus group, uh, these seven sort of uh, groups, uh, people were from the same community, but each group was from a different community. Uh, focus groups happened predominantly in English, but also had um, a sort of peer translation uh, system at play. So whether it was one of the, 
the organizers from the service organizations or whether it was one of the peers, um, oftentimes women would sort of flip into their, uh, their first language um, and then they would, you know, someone would translate those, those details as the conversation got a little bit more robust. Uh, finally, we did conduct a workshop with service providers with the refugee serving organizations um, to review our preliminary findings. This was in February of 2020. And then we were subsequently going to do the same with the with the refugee women, but we're unable to, of course, because of the pandemic. So what did we find? Women navigate dynamic and overlapping socio-technical ecosystems. So I described this uh, concept of feminist socio-technical theory, where we have a relationship between society and technology as components that are mutually shaping. So what we are talking about here and what we have found is that women have particular and distinct types of socio-technical ecosystems, of ecosystems and environments that are shaped by both society and technology, and that these are broken down into what we have described as three sort of spheres or three domains, one being home and community, the second being public daily life, and the third being the formal resettlement sort of ecosystem, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. Women engage in different types of learning related to the different ecosystems. So we were also interested in understanding how do women learn in these environments? What kind of access and education allows them to participate in these technological environments? So what we found is that there were different types of learning in different settings, and those ranged from self-learning to social learning and community support, as well as some interaction with formal learning. And so I think what we found in the formal setting is, is perhaps less of a surprise. We know that people take classes and endeavor to improve their skills through these formal educational opportunities, but some of the self-learning and the social learning and community support were, were quite um, insightful. And then we also know that women's technology engagements can often go unseen, um, particularly if we focus primarily on digital technologies. So this was something that uh, we perhaps, I don't want to know, I don't want to say necessarily that we suspected, but we, we considered to the extent that we asked and that we, as noted, entered this with a broader definition of what constitutes technology. Um, and we did find that there were actually lots of technology interactions for women. Um, they were just not only situated in the digital domain. So this is a, a sort of graphical representation of some of what we learned and thinking about the ecosystems in the middle of the, the sort of Venn diagram, family and community, public life and resettlement. And what you see are some of the examples in each. We'll come back to this graphic and then I will also be talking through it. Um, so you'll have other opportunities to, to look at this. Um, I want to start by talking about home and community or family and community and the type of, of learning that happens there. So women did talk quite a bit about household appliances and also in ways that perhaps we are not thinking about when we're thinking about the types of technology that are important for people to learn when they arrive in a new country. So this is a quote from focus, discussion, uh, focus group discussion number three. At first, I didn't understand how to use the dryer at all. My friend came to me and says, what kind of a greasy layer do you have here? And I say, how do I know? This is the first time in my life I've seen a dryer. How do I know that it has to be cleaned? In a different case, in focus group discussion two, we have a woman from a different community saying, we cook, sometimes we can try with new food, like American food, something like that, we learn. Some Vietnamese food we can learn too. Whatever we like, we don't know, we learn from them. I'm watching the YouTube tips, how to cook, how to do art on the nails, things like that. 
So here we see a, a sort of explanation of uh, how media is being used and how YouTube is being used in this case um, to actually learn a lot about the, the sort of cultural norms and practices. In uh, this example, the women also proceeded to talk about using the oven and the microwave and um, things that were designed differently, if not at all, in some cases available, um, and something new to their cooking practice. So it is also the case that most participants described how husbands and children were often the arbiters of technology for them, sometimes helping them navigate typing search engines and other elements of technology that depend largely on a moderate level of English. So what we heard a lot was that as men had more opportunity to learn English, to be out of the house and to focus on their own English language learning, or in some cases had come in already with a little bit more English, um, they also became the ones who uh, had to sort of navigate the technology, not because the women didn't understand how to use an iPad and go on YouTube, but, but because they simply didn't have the, the, the language skills, you know, to do so, um, you know, in looking at some of the English learning sites that they wanted to access. Um, some women also described their husbands translating news for them entirely if they wanted local news, um, you know, that, that they needed to uh, have that kind of, of access and opportunity through their family members. Other types of social media usage were more varied. Many women used WhatsApp and text communication with family and peers. Others mentioned FaceTime or Skype to talk to families. I mean, this was 2018, 2019, um, which, you know, I think in the last few years, we've really seen also a jump in everyone's competency with some of these tools. Online shopping also um, surfaced as uh, several women and participants described uh, that, that this online shopping domain was something that they learned to navigate, navigate and ultimately did so with success. Uh, and one thing that is clear from this data is that home and community are central parts of women's lives and technology is integrated across their work and leisure time. So not something that is formally sort of addressed um, through their resettlement programs and training. So let's talk a little bit about uh, public life. I think this is actually maybe the, the most interesting of the three. Um, driving, transportation, and maps came up quite a lot as a technological center point for women's lives. Uh, one participant uh, in one example and discussion, a group of women were discussing driving, um, transportation, and maps and said, I have a problem. One person said, I have a problem with driving. Sometimes when I go to work, um, the road is closed because they have a problem they need to fix. I call my husband, can you pick me up? Then he told me I need to learn how to use the Google Maps, but sometimes I focus when driving and I can't listen at the same time because my English is not very good. When I have to do different things at one time, that's why I need for him to come over. He drives in front and I follow him. Participant four then says, I sometimes use the phone, sometimes it doesn't connect, so I can't find the road as well. There's a couple of things potentially going on here. So we didn't have an opportunity to sort of follow on uh, the degree to which we know there can be multiple languages that you can set uh, your different devices to. So we weren't really clear uh, this would be something we would want to follow up on for sure in subsequent studies if uh, individuals didn't know how to change the language or if the language, if their, if their language uh, choice wasn't very available, which is also possible. Um, also, of course, in the, the last sentence here with participant four, uh, there is a, a, a suggestion here that there's a problem, obviously, with the, the internet connection, the data access, um, or perhaps the quality of the phone. Another participant described a different kind of engagement with technology and public life, um, enrolling in college and applying for financial aid. The woman went through the online application system and then needed her parents to sign the form electronically and include their government identification information, uh, which proved to be, to be challenging. Uh, 
The following excerpt describes the situation as it unfolded. So note that she describes how they told her what to do, pointing to moments of interaction with a public service or support that is designed to navigate these problems. Signing for the parents, they completed everything. They completed their addresses, names, email addresses for the financial aid application, social security, everything, only the signature. I used to click on the signature, it's not coming out, so they told me what to do, to go and scan, make a signature, and send it through their mail. The, the program was called you know, FAFSA, and send it through the FAFSA mail. As the participant worked through the process, the deadline for the submission passed, and she did not know how to proceed, and, or if she could still apply, given the various technical and logistical difficulties she had in navigating the system. So the narratives presented in this ecosystem capture moments in time when participants first encountered technology in a way that interacted with distinct elements of public daily life. In many cases, the women we spoke to learned to navigate these tools and activities, though not without anxieties. Some women face long-term barriers to doing things independently, including taking classes, improving their English language skills, learning to drive or working. The technology interactions that generate the most stress for them seem to relate to daily activities that involve women's public interactions with larger systems like education, retail, commerce, and transportation. We had women, for example, also talking about using the self-checkout at the grocery store and having a line of people behind them and feeling that sort of stress around how do I navigate this new tool something perhaps many of us have experienced as well in other ways. Um, finally, we have this resettlement context and these formal programs for resettlement. Um, a lot of them focus on technology, education, and employment. So those exist for sure. It's very well understood that these are needed. Um, technology learning is often embedded within different employment-related services, such as job search, CV prep, entrepreneurship training. Um, there were also training programs for home-based childcare providers, which sometimes included technology, you know, as a tool to manage this kind of an independent or small business. Um, Technology education was also integrated with English language learning classes, and technology and language learning in this way also intersect. Um, in some ways, other types of, uh, of training programs for women also had opportunities for technology training. Sewing groups uh, helped to improve English skills while maintaining cultural ties via fabric and designs that resonated with women's traditional and social norms um, and sometimes would lead to sort of ad hoc opportunities to look up designs on a phone or troubleshoot how to do something on YouTube. A lot of what we found was that as uh, agencies offered programs that were focused on job search, on language, on childcare or the school system or things that were not deliberately uh, technological, that there was a lot of sort of integrated technology learning, but also that a lot of those refugee serving organization staff ended up doing a lot of uh, ad hoc on the fly, one on one teaching in order to support women and help them navigate, you know, how to use the different technologies and in particular ICTs that were a part of their world. So we understand that technology has to be learned and understood in context and service providers do play an important role in trying to highlight how and where this happens, especially related to the use of computer and phone technologies for employment through formal programs. There are, however, and there were in the states funding restrictions in terms of how and what uh, you know, agencies can offer. There were also limitations to how and when women could access what is available, which intersects with their gender expectations. So for example, women's ability to participate in a lot of the services that were available was inconsistent because of their childcare expectations, because they had to go and pick up their kids from school, because they had to cook meals and have things prepared in the home. Um, and women in this study predominantly described that childcare schedules and domestic responsibilities, as well as problems with transportation, 
um, became major barriers to participation for them in these formal programs. So what we understand is that the challenges include, um, you know, how these formal programs can meet the needs of diverse cultural and language groups, um, how they can attend to varied literacy and language skills, that there's scarce funding and inconsistent funding often for a lot of these organizations. Um, you can have varied and changing staff expertise with technology. And so, as I described, a lot of the technology support was happening in ad hoc ways. So, depending on how comfortable the particular staff member is and how technologically literate they are, the quality and extensiveness of that support can really vary. Uh, for women, there are competing needs and priorities. And ultimately, you know, as we continually see the persistence of patriarchy um, as a as a social design that continues to sort of remove women from the technological do domain. So what does this mean? Um, we see that there are some clear gaps between the types of services available by refugee serving organizations and the types of support women need to further develop their socio-technical competencies. There are omissions with regards to where refugee women are learning to use technology in relation to how other types of formal training are being provided. So how can we think about this a little bit further uh, and in more concrete ways? For example, how could tools and media like Netflix, YouTube, and TikTok programs, uh, programming and their subtitling features or their sort of interactive multimedia features be used to develop learning opportunities for women? And how do we or should we formalize those opportunities? What types of social media and digital content available online can be turned into employment or language programs for at home and peer to peer learning where women were learning so much from each other in their peer networks. Um, how do we sort of harness that. How do we support that for women as it's already working. And how can stress and anxiety related to new domestic tools and engaging in complex technological systems be diminished through programmatic support. So our questions really center around where the money is going and what kinds of supports we perhaps want to be offering and building and creating for women that can be you know, offered and delivered closer to home, both literally and figuratively in terms of the lives that they lead and the, the ways in which they can actually engage with these opportunities. And I think that is, is probably about where I'll wrap up the formal components of this talk. Um, this uh, project was conducted uh, as a team with uh, myself, Maria Garrido, who is a principal research scientist at the University of Washington in the Technology and Social Change Group, Stacy Wedlake, who's also uh, a research scientist in the same organization at the University of Washington, and Katya Yefimova, a PhD candidate there in the Faculty of Information as well. Thank you very much. And this is where we open up the conversation. So if you have a question, put it in the chat or put up your hand and we'll see that the question gets asked and answered as well. Um, Nagin, it, we've seen that the realm of technology is so much broader than most of us thought it was. Um, that's very interesting to see. Um, I've been hearing so often that migration is the single most important issue of the 21st century. And this is what you're dealing with here. How did you come to start studying this? Mm, um, yeah, I, uh, I had some sort of interest in the subject of migration and in the context of refugees in particular, largely just out of personal interest, you know, partly uh, to some degree, you know, my own sort of personal history and family history, and then as something that I just saw as um, a world issue that that I cared about. And when I was doing my PhD at York University um, in the early, like, 2010s, um, I just sought out a job uh, at the Center for Refugee Studies. So I was just a PhD student looking for work uh, 
that was going to be of interest. Um, and I found some, you know, light part time work uh, at the Center for Refugee Studies. And through that work, I then just became more involved. I met people doing things that were in line with what I was interested to do. I became involved with a large scale research project. Um, focused on refugee education and online learning in the Dadaab refugee camps in Kenya. Um, and I was also doing my PhD in a faculty of education. And so all of these, you know, interests sort of uh, came together at that time. And then from there, I, I learned a lot and I, I sort of developed my own research trajectory in this area as well. And your next steps, where are you going? Well, I, yeah, I continue to have some projects um, looking at education and technology in refugee camps. So I have one project currently uh, in the Mal in the Zaleka refugee camp in Malawi, uh, where we're looking at the relationship broadly uh, between education and technology in that community. We've been working with uh, six community researchers in, um, in Zaleka for the past several years and uh, doing a, a very uh, participatory study asking uh, in the community and among the community researchers, what are the education and technology um, settings that are valuable? So there is a lot of attention and focus on online learning from the international community on digital literacy on coding classes and all of these are important so that's not to take away at all from the importance of those but in the same uh sense of sort of thinking more broadly about technology we kind of wanted to ask this question of what is happening and how are people taking up different tools in the community and so there uh, we've been studying uh, sewing and sewing training uh, settings where people are using YouTube and Instagram and uh, digital technologies in order to support the work that they're doing with sewing machines, electrical and mechanical, um, and learning to repair those machines and learning to sew and learning to sort of develop their businesses and using economic business tools. Um, you know, in that entire environment. So again, sort of looking at this picture of a broader ecosystem of learning and technology uh, that goes perhaps beyond the digital frame. In that project, we're looking at sewing, we're looking at uh, music production and DJing media, which was also generated from the community researchers as of relevance to the community, and also at formal online learning and technology classrooms. Um, and we do have a, a, a book contract with the University of Toronto Press. So hopefully uh, in the next couple of years, we'll, we'll be completing a book project uh, based on what we've been learning in that project. That's so interesting. Rima has a question. Um, and Elizabeth is just- Thanks again, Lucy. Yes, um, I have a question. You, you were just saying about technology and um, access to computers, access to phones or whatever. We all know refugees tend to come from very low income uh, background, um, moving to a country that they don't have a lot of uh, financial um, ability to afford all those technologies or all those new things that uh, we are privileged to have. How can they access all of that stuff in order to be able to get involved in the social media aspect or um, sure. to have like, the accessibility for all those stuff that you were just mentioning. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people now are coming equipped with phones. So there is actually a lot of access to mobile phones. Uh, sometimes the regularity of internet connectivity is a problem. So they might have the device and they might know how to use the device. Um, but having, you know, data plans and phone plans on a regular basis is a financial barrier. Um, but depending on the, I suppose, the, the generation, there are definitely some generational differences, but we're certainly finding that, um, you know, refugees anywhere between, you know, uh, for sure from a young age, but even uh, up to their 40s, uh, you know, plus are are pretty equipped. 
um, you know, older generations of grandparents, you know, in, in maybe their 60s, 70s, you know, really um, folks who perhaps didn't grow up with these tools. Um, certainly there can be a divide, but I don't think that that is exclusive to uh, refugees uh, or even migration. Of course, we see those kinds of digital divides ongoing in society as well. Um, typically, you know, for some of the broader uh, access points to technology and technology literacy, if we want to extend the conversation out from mobile phones to, you know, computers and computer literacy, um, nonprofit community organizations offer courses. The libraries often are great resources, of course. We love, uh, I love having a library partner on this lecture series. Um, you know, a lot of the local libraries do great work and have a lot of programs and have access to computers and have access to Wi Fi and internet. And so these are all places where uh, people are directed, and the, the libraries do really a lot of work. Um, to, to help people learn and are definitely in the broad category. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about what types of refugee serving organizations we worked with in this study, but uh, libraries were one of the, the groups who, who serve a lot of uh, refugee and migrant communities. Oh, oh. A lot of refugees refugees do come with a lot of media savvy. That's a, a bit of a surprise to a lot of people. They don't think of that, but that is the truth. Is there anything else that you found surprising in your research? Um, I think we were uh, surprised by one, the ways in which, uh, you know, media leisure, what we would maybe describe as leisure media, like YouTube and Netflix and things like that, were really used as ways for, for women at home to engage in different levels of self-learning. So whether it was learning independently, um, whether that was language learning by watching TV shows, or um, learning how to cook or learning how to literally use a microwave um, by searching for videos online. I think that was a surprise, even among, you know, women who often describe themselves as not being very technologically competent, then you would hear people describe the things that they are doing and realize that there's also a kind of a discrepancy here between you know, sometimes how we see ourselves and how we talk about ourselves in relation to technology, likely because a lot of the ways technology is described refer to, you know, being really tech savvy and coding and, you know, do you know how to do all of these sort of like advanced things with computers? And yet many people actually know how to do a lot with technology, but don't perceive themselves to be technologically literate. So there's a kind of gap and tension in, in that space that, that surfaced as women described the ways in which they actually used um, some of these media and leisure tools as part of their learning in the, in the domestic sphere. And then uh, a second sort of surprise, I think, was um, similarly a, a sort of psychosocial or emotional kind of response to using technology out in the world that a lot of the anxieties of being seen or a, a feeling or worry of being seen while trying to do something which again i think is a very human experience right one that we can often you know you're driving and you get lost and you're slowing down but somebody is behind you and it feels stressful these types of experiences were perhaps doubly a deterrent for women trying to engage in their new social environment um, because they're also dealing with language and I don't know how to use the phone and I don't know how to read the map and I, you know, I don't know where I am and I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to ask for help. And there's just so many things that you, you feel in a new place, perhaps that you don't know what to do. Um, and so the anxieties of that social environment, I think were, were really a challenge, uh, as well. 
That's so interesting. There's a question from the audience, and I'm going to read it because it's a very long, complicated question, and we can repeat it over and over again. Okay, yeah. In your study, was there a correlation between women's age and their reliance on others for language or technology support? For example, adult women relying more on their husbands to use digital technologies as opposed to seeking support from their teen or young adult daughters, etc. And how has this changed over the years as access to technology and information changes? Sure, yeah, good question. Um, we didn't interview anyone. We only interviewed adults. Um, and most of the women who came to the focus groups were, you know, 30 and in their 30s and 40s. So we didn't really engage directly with teens and younger adult daughters, for example. Um, however, women did refer to their families and when talking about their children, they didn't necessarily say it was only their boys who were helping them. They, they, they kind of referred to having daughters, to having sons, and to that sort of age-based um, consideration around digital literacy and technological sort of competence. Um, so language support and technology support, um, we didn't really break down exactly, you know, the age and, um, you know, the sex or gender identity of their children, um, but they really talked about their families, about husbands and children broadly, uh, presumably including uh, girls and, and women. Um, how has this changed over the years? Um, I don't know. That That is a very good kind of question. Um, I think that is something that, you know, we would have to try to go back to this community and, and see what has changed. We would have to talk to women who have been here, you know, for a long time. Some of the sort of learning and acculturation, you know, happens as you exist in a place and you are just sort of slowly over time, you know, forced to learn and become accustomed with how to do certain things, right? Like you you need to, you know, post COVID, you need to scan a QR code to get a menu at a restaurant a lot of the time, right? And so I think that there are inevitably ways that um, there would be changes over time for everybody. And I don't think there's a reason to, um, think necessarily that that would not be true for these communities um but i don't i don't really have the the answer to that and of course we can continue to rely on other people for some of that support as well right like we can you know have someone else pull up a menu on a phone for us if we're not sort of equipped to do that so i I think that we see we see changes all around us, but there remains a lot of variability in how it might get taken up. But I don't have any specific sort of data on that question. But thank you for the for the questions. Okay. At the beginning of your presentation, you showed statistics about US rates of refugees and then Canadian rates. And I was trying to do the math and, and you know how, how much our population is smaller. And I think their population is about 10 times ours. So it seems that our the rate of refugees coming into Canada is much higher. That's correct, right? Yeah, I would think. I mean, so and certainly over the Trump years, right? Like you saw a big a big decline, and now an effort to bring that back up. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, we have sometimes comparable rates, um, and our you know I don't know what the the proportional size of our economy is. Uh, our population size is definitely 10 times smaller, right? There's 330 million people in the United States or something like 35 million, 38 million in Canada. Um, so, yeah, we're certainly a smaller country and we can take basic sort of markers of economic strength, such as, you know, the value of the dollar and know that our, our economy is is obviously strong, but not not as strong. 
Um, and yeah, it seems that we take more refugees proportionally than the US. So this would be a good place to study the refugee situation, yes? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it is, uh, you know, it is a question of um, what you, like, maybe what you want is to study the, the it's, there's a, like, that is said, and yet it is still extremely difficult for refugees who come here, right? The services, the access, the timelines are, are still very limited. Um, there is much work to be done here still, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and sometimes because the U.S. can be such a, a center point and powerhouse for international policy, for uh, models of activities and and things that that uh, programs and practices that ensue. Um, you know, I think it is also important to pay attention to what is happening there. I think it is it is true that we are a very distinct country with uh, with particulars that are our own, and it is also very true that we are deeply influenced um, by the United States as our, you know, main neighbors and trade partners, and you know. Uh, everything else that that we share in the the cultural domain and the technological domain in particular so uh, you know we we have to do the the distinguishing work of what happens in this country and what happens there and i think we have to also see where those similarities lie yes this is going to be the last chance for anyone to ask questions you can get them up in the chat or you can put up your hand right away if you or we'll leave it at that this has been a most interesting and important subject to discuss. Thank you so much, Professor Daya. Just giving it one last chance for one last question to pop up. <laughs> Nothing's coming. So I guess that takes us to the end of our evening. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, everyone who is here and thank you all for inviting me and for hosting. Um, I appreciate having the time to talk about the subject. And there, there's some very complimentary comments there at the yes. very end. So Thank again, so our, next, our next Lecture Me program will be How Children Learn Language with Professor Johnson, and that's April 4th at 7 p.m. This is the end of our program tonight. You can give us feedback by filling out a survey. Um, thank you for joining us, everybody. Good night. Thanks very much. Good night, everybody.